On today's program, former host Steve Owens shows us how to train standards. Junior Master Gardener Coordinator Shelly Mitchell visits with a 4-H'er who creates planters out of scrap guttering. Former host Brenda Sanders has vining plants for every location. And we have garden tips for May. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. The word standard is generally used to describe an ideal to which other things are measured. But in the horticultural world, a standard trained plant means something a bit different. It's a pruning technique. It's when you take a naturally shrubby mounding plant, kind of like this one right here, and you train it to have a single stem that comes up tall, and then it is pruned to have a ball of foliage up at the top, kind of like we got right here. This is a copper leaf. This is one called Inferno with small leaves, one of my favorite. But you can see that uh, this is not the natural growth form or habit of the plant. It's been manipulated. We, uh, we took a single stem, trained it up, and we created sort of a ball on a stick or, or a small tree. Now, this is used a lot of times for uh, tropical flowering shrubs like lantana. In fact, lantana is probably the most plant often train as a standard. You can see the plant starts out like this and again it's manipulated grown into a nice little tree. But these make great patio container specimens. You see we've got it in a pot here. We bring it inside and out each summer and it has a nice ball of flowers at the top. It looks fantastic. And these can live for several years. In fact, there's a one at Oklahoma Gardening that I started when I was garden manager almost 20 years ago, and uh, it's still used at the Studio Gardens. But the Inferno Copper Leaf here, you can see this is a one-year-old plant. This one's a little bit older. This one's about two years old. And you can see that the stem gets thicker over time, and eventually it'll get strong enough we can take this stake away and it will support its own weight. So it really will look like a small tree. There are a lot of plants that can be used to train into a standard. This is a variegated myrtle and it's got small leaves and this one's grown a little bit taller than you normally would with a, a small fine textured plant. Uh, these actually look nice if they're a smaller height so you don't have to spend that much time to grow one this tall. Sometimes things like rosemary and uh, lavender are trained in that way uh, at a smaller height or a smaller standard. This is a curry plant, another little fragrant herb, and you can see it looks nice even though the stem is not quite as tall. But again, the plant starts out like this and we train it into a ball on a stick. It's not all that hard to train a plant to a standard. You select an appropriate plant, something that has a, a strong enough stem to support a ball of foliage up at the top. Again, lantana used a lot, the variegated myrtle, those are used a lot, and uh, you wouldn't believe it, but coleus over time will develop a really thick stem and become almost woody. Now, Finding a plant at a nursery or garden center may be a little bit of a, a, a trick because naturally the, uh, the nursery growers or the, the, the people managing the, the garden centers will be pruning or pinching these back so they do look nice and bushy. This is a coleus called Peter's Wonder and it got missed. Uh, it didn't get the top pinched out to cause that bushiness so it would be an excellent candidate for a standard. You see that main stem there uh, well on its way 
to uh, becoming a, a standard trained coleus. Now this one, this one's called Orange King, one of my favorite coleus. You can see where it was pinched a while back right here, but we could come in and cut one of these away and uh, retain this one as our, our standard leader. I'm gonna start with this uh, lantana right here. It's got this nice straight stem, got the bud up at the top. It's gonna come in, this, this looks cool I know, but I'm gonna cut that away. Put this to the side and then we'll take a stake. We're gonna get it as close to the main stem as possible and get it straight up and down. I'm gonna put it in, kind of twist it a little bit. Try not to damage any roots, but uh, hopefully the plant is healthy enough those will grow back pretty quick. And then we need to tie it. And when you're tying your standard to the stake, there are a number of things you could use. You could use something like nylon hose that uh, will stretch and not cause any girdling or restricting uh, of the stem that can cause some damage. If you use a twisty tie that's plastic with a wire inside, you could do kind of the, uh, kind of the old fashioned or the, the normal uh, twist of the twisty tie like this, but this will girdle the plant as the stem gets larger. So this will have to be checked uh, very often and uh, loosened uh, to accommodate the growing stem. Now one other method of applying a, uh, a twisty tie is to do kind of the curly cue method where you just kind of wrap it, kind of snake fashion around the stem and that way it's not as constricting and as the stem gets larger it kind of pushes it apart. Uh, rope needs to be checked periodically. This is a plastic rope and one year I made the mistake of leaving this on some lantana too long and I thought maybe it would give a little bit but it didn't and it really girdled the stem and the stem ended up snapping. So if you use something really constricting make sure you check it uh, quite often. Uh, this type of material is just a strip of a cloth from an old t-shirt that works great as well. Now as your plant is growing, you want to uh, keep this, this, this top bud, this apical bud, straight up and you want it to get to the height where you want it, your, uh, your ball of foliage and flowers uh, to be located. And if it isn't kept in that upright position, you can have some issues. That uh, bud up at the top of the stem actually releases a hormone that will keep the other buds from growing. You can see what happened here with this myrtle. Uh, it kind of broke free from the top of the stake and uh, I didn't catch it and it kind of laid sideways for a while and you see all this other growth kind of branching out here so we kind of lost that uh, that apical dominance. Now we can fix this we'll just tie it up here and uh, uh, eventually pinch it and cause that ball of foliage to to form up at the top. I've got an example right here with a lantana that uh, we're working on to create a standard and it got tall enough and you can see the little stem here that uh, has been uh, been pruned that's where we, we topped it or we cut it off and then you can noticeably see what happened to all these side branches you can see they just kind of shot off in all directions well that's what we want at this point once it is tall enough so now we'll just come in with our pruners and we'll make lots of cuts to start to form that ball of foliage if something happens along the way and your, your top bud uh, gets broken away, you can do some repair or, uh, or fix that. This is a, a pentus, and you can see right here, our terminal bud got cut away, and look what happened. Two, two shoots began to take off, so we no longer have a main central leader. But we can fix that. I'm gonna take my pruners here, gonna make a cut, but you can see, we got a big bump right there. So what I'm gonna do is take a razor blade, come in here, and we're just gonna kinda slice that away. Just kinda grind down that bump. Really sharp razor works great. And what will happen after a while is the plant will start to seal over, kinda fix that wound, and then eventually you won't even notice that there was another stem there. We'll just tie that to a stake, sort of like a splint, and uh, that bump will sort of go away after a while. Now, as far as maintenance goes on your standard, when they get really big, uh, you will need to shear the ball of uh, foliage up at the top. So that's not really hard to do. Just come in and kind of just take this down a little bit 
always leaving some leaves. You don't want to cut off all the leaves. And then of course the, uh, the stem itself will get little shoots or suckers coming up along the stem. So we'll need to uh, keep those removed as well. I'm Ann McMurtry, an ambassador at the Botanic Garden at Oklahoma State University, and I'm here to give you your garden tips for May. Trees and shrubs. Prune and feed your azaleas immediately after blooming. There's an insect alert for bagworms on junipers and arborvitae, elm leaf beetles and larvae on elms, and lace bugs on sycamores, pyracantha, and azalea. Soak new transplants unless rainfall is abundant. Pine needle disease treatments are also needed in mid-May. with Sky Oliver, a sixth grader from Ripley, Oklahoma, who's also a 4-H'er, and he decided to do something really unique for a recycling project. He decided to make gutter gardens. Can you tell us about your gutter garden? We get them from leftover guttering jobs, like leftover from our house, or just leftover from like, if they have made too many. And um, so tell me about how you make one of these. This is just this is just a regular piece of gathering. Yep. And what what's the process of making one of these? Well, if it's dented up, we would like cut cut out a good piece and then. I see you like painted one of them. Yes. Yeah, so let's say if it's all scratched up and and you don't well you don't want a scratched up gutter garden, paint it. You don't like the color, paint it. This one's not as well spray painted. Okay, I notice here you have some of these end pieces and one has an L and one has an R. So I guess that means left and right? Yep. So you would put one of these on, but then how do you get it to stay on? You just tool called a crimp. You just put it on there and you would squeeze it. So, and like you do like about, uh, about about on every side. inch. Like a couple like an on inch each or, side? Yeah, yeah, a couple on every, every side. Like, you put one on both ends and then afterwards. what is, what is, this. this. Is this to keep it from leaking? Yeah. Keep the water in. Well, not only really keep the water in, but like, can I keep it help stay and But you wouldn't want it to totally hold water, so what would you do? What would you do oh, to the bottom here? We put holes in the you have a drill, but this drill doesn't have a bit. So we put a hole in the bottom. Oh, like every uh, every this is a two footer, there's two holes in it. But we don't have a three footer as an example, but So basically got, like a hole every foot? Just about, yeah. And like this one has two, um, I forgot what they're called. But, um, brackets? Yes, brackets. And what are they for? Stable, they stabilize it, and that's what we put your, the hole, you put the hole. So show me how you install a bracket. Okay, so after you do the measurements. So like space them out evenly? Yeah, and then where to put them. You get this, like there's like a little lip right here. You get the, the hook part of this into there. Then you get a hammer, you'd hammer it down. Okay. And then I see you have holes right here. Yes, that's what we would, after that, you'd make a hole with the drill. And we have little screws over here. And you just put this, you usually use well, a drill. I mean, that's what this bit's, this current bit's for, holds the drill magnet. And what would you screw it into, like a fence or? A fence, tree, if you wanted to, you could try to do it on a brick wall. And I'm what do you put in your gardens? Oh, flowers, currently we have flowers and onions right now. But there's, you could probably, um, I don't know if, if I can do carrots or anything, something that goes too far underground or goes too up or too heavy. And then you probably made a whole bunch of these, but I don't think you use them all. What do you do with the extras? Well, you, we made a bunch, trying to sell them, but like at first, prices weren't very, let's, they didn't sell very well. A little of the prices, they sold a little better. But how we price them is we use, like, okay, two, like $2 because, two, okay, at least $2 for these, because there's two of them, and like a dollar for every one of these, and since, these two, it would only take two, the three and the two foot, 
but if it's like a four foot, probably about three, five. The longer it is, the more of these you have. So you just basically recoup the price for your parts and then a little bit for your labor. Yeah. Well, that's like a really neat way to, to green up the world, like literally, because you're using recycled materials and you're planting more green. Yep. And you're getting green. Turf grass tips for May are cool season lawns can be fertilized again. If you did not fertilize cool season grasses in March and April, do so now. Warm season lawns can be fertilized again in May. Seeding of warm season grasses such as Bermuda grass, buffalo grass, zoysia grass, and centipede grass is best performed in mid-May through the end of June. Vegetative establishment of warm season grasses can continue. Nut sedge plants become visible this month. Post-emergent treatments are best applied for the first time this month. Make certain warm season grasses have completed. The second application of pre-emergent annual grass herbicides can be applied in late May or early June, depending on timing of the first application. Well, here we are in the middle of planting season and probably everybody's out buying plants, getting them in the ground. And I just wanted to talk about one of the plants that I think is underused. It's actually a group of plants, vining plants. And um, they really are very hardy. In fact, you might have heard horror stories of kudzu, uh, the wisteria that ate the back porch. But that actually works in our favor if we do a little pre-planning. Um, vines do very well at adding height to the garden, like here, out in the middle, if you notice around there are a lot of low shrubs, low growing plants, then we can put a structure here and put, this is a clematis that has been trained onto this and in the middle of the summer this will be nice and some height to the garden. They can also be used as screens, they can cover things that we don't want to see. Um, the main thing to think about when you are planting vines, it's like every other plant, you want to uh, take a look at what it needs, what sun, shade, what kind of water, drainage, things like that. There's another thing that you need to think about with vines. It's what type of structure do they grow on? And we're going to take a look at several out here in the gardens and I'll just kind of give you a primer on how to choose the best vine for your location. Now vines kind of land in three different large groupings of how they climb a structure. There are vines that cling, there are also vines that use tendrils and then there are vines that twine and this is English ivy and it is one of the clinging vines and clinging vines actually have special little appendages that they use to be able to climb a surface. Now that's a good thing in a lot of ways because they require less help getting up their surface that they need to climb. English ivy is, we kind of know it as a ground cover, it's pretty hardy and it grows mostly in the shade. It doesn't like a lot of sun. Um, it can go either in moist places or dry places, so it's very hardy that way. And it can climb. Now it needs a rough surface because it has these little root-like appendages here that actually grab onto the surface and that helps it climb. And these do not, it's not a parasitic plant. These don't go in, they're not roots that take moisture and nutrients out of the tree. All they do, it's like a person with little bitty fingers, they kind of grab on. And so that's something to remember if you plant an English ivy and you would like it to cover something, it's not going to cover a smooth surface, but it will cover a rough surface like a tree. Um, you don't want to plant them next to your house that has wood siding. Any kind of vine, if you have wood siding, don't plant it directly on your house because what happens is these vines work their way in and then they grow and they just will pop the siding off. And that's very important with any vine to kind of take into account um, what it's going to do when it grows. We're going to take a look at another type of clinging vine. This is another one of the clinging vines. It's, Vir it's Virginia creeper and it has a little bit different type of appendage. If you look very closely here, you can see it looks like little suction cups. Uh, kind of like lizards have, you know, they can suction and that is how it attaches to surfaces. Now this will actually grow on smooth surfaces. It would grow right over your window if you planted it there. And so um, you have to be careful 
uh, Virginia creeper, also Boston ivy is a great one. They grow very quickly, they cover large areas. You kind of want to keep an eye on them because they can get out of control. And the other thing I want to show you here, the difference between here's what this vine likes to climb on. See how thick it is here? Here is where it has been planted growing up where these are and you notice it really doesn't use them that much. It actually wants to run over and use these smooth surfaces to climb up to the top of our arbor. So that's another reason why it's very important to kind of know your vine before you plant it. Another group of vines that climb using tendrils and grapes are a great example of that. You can see here there's a grape and tendrils are small appendages that actually wind around things. And this is a very good example here. Uh, this grape has been planted and look, we have the smooth surface. And you notice here, the grape doesn't really have anything to grab onto. They've, we've had to do some helping right here. We have to tie it up. And that's what's gonna happen if you would like to train a grape um, to grow on an arbor and you've got this smooth surface, you're gonna need to help it along, do a lot of tying. Now, if you'd rather not do as much tying, you could do something like put a cattle panel up. And it, you can see right here, the tendrils have grabbed onto another part of the grape. This is about the size of the wire um, that tendrils like to grab onto. So cattle panels, chicken wire, you need to have something sturdy um, that it can climb on is great. Now our third group of plants are twiners, and that's probably the biggest group, and there are several different types of twiners that we're going to look at. Now climbing roses would be classed in the twiners uh, group of vines. They're a little different in that they're kind of twiny, kind of just whatever they can grab onto with their thorns. And you can see here, uh, climbing rose, actually you will need to do quite a bit of training if you want it to um, get to the top where you can have it cover. And also, just so that it doesn't blow out when we have a really big windstorm, um, all of this, if you've only got it tied up with one uh, tie and a windstorm comes through, the whole thing could blow off of the trellis and onto the ground. So this is kind of a, a twiner, yeah, it, see how it grabs? It grabs things. Um, and that's basically how it climbs, whatever it can grab onto and then start to kind of twine around. We'll take a look at one last twiner that's like the twiner of all twining vines. Well, wisteria is one of the plants that people think of when they think of vining plants, twining plants. Wisteria is kind of a, has sentimental value and they look so beautiful when they're trained right but they also need to be planted with caution. You need to make sure that you have a very sturdy structure in place for a wisteria. Um, and also that sturdy structure shouldn't be your house or your gutter or anything like that because as the plant grows, it actually kind of works like a constrictor. It grows and it kind of will pull down structures because it gets so heavy. And if you look here, it also shows a good example of how twining plants actually climb. They twine around anything that they can get a hold of. That'll be a structure, a wire, other twining plants. Um, wisteria is beautiful, and um, but it can be a little bit hard to control. So there's another plant here that's maybe a better choice. Some of the honeysuckles work very well, climbs in the same way. Um, but you notice this honeysuckle is actually growing on the wisteria. And you notice you need to have a smaller, again, a little bit smaller uh, gauge wire or something like that for it to get started on. Now, of course, once it gets a hold, it can pretty much stay where it is. But to start it, it takes a little bit more training at first. But these are some things to take into consideration if you're going to plant a vine they're great plants as long as you plan ahead. Flower tips for May are annual bedding plants can be set out for summer color if you haven't already done it. Plant your summer bulbs such as cannas, dahlias, elephant ear, caladiums, and gladiolas this month. For your fruits and vegetables, the month of May tips are plant watermelon, cantaloupe, cucumber, eggplant, okra, sweet potatoes, and other vegetables this month. 
Fruit spray program should be faithfully continued during the next several weeks. Late May is the best time to control boars in the orchard. The Botanic Garden at Oklahoma State University begins its open houses this month. Myself and other ambassadors welcome you to come out and view our beautiful garden on the first and third Saturdays of each month through our growing season. We're here to host you and answer any questions you may have about any of the flowers or plants here in the garden. Here's one of the great gardening activities coming up in Oklahoma. Next week, turfgrass specialist Justin Moss has tips for establishing warm season lawn from seed. Barbara Brown prepares a delicious spinach salad. OSU Stillwater Campus urban forester Chris Martin shows how to properly plant a container grown tree. And we kick off our viewers garden contest. So join us then for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.